Hey guys, Caitlin here. And for this week's YouTube video, I thought it would be a good time to go over measles, mumps, and rubella. Um, that is a vaccine that you are supposed to get, um, yeah, your children are supposed to get at 12 to 15 months of age, and then again at four to six years of age. Um, if you've gotten these vaccines, it covers and usually prevents the majority of measles, mumps, and rubella cases. Um, but a lot of people aren't getting vaccines anymore and measles, mumps, and rubella are popping back up. And I actually had my first mumps case the other day and we're actually having a little epidemic in my area. So I thought it'd be a good time to review this. So let's get started. Also, just because you've gotten the vaccine does not prevent you and or exclude you from ever getting measles, mumps, or rubella later in life. It just has a significantly less possibility of having that later in life. Um, and then I also have to add a little bit of MMR has not been shown or any vaccine has not been shown to have any correlation nor causation towards autism or any other chronic disease cases. So if you want to look up these studies and the evidence-based medicine on up to date, there's actually 156 separate studies that they've cited on up to date about these specific vaccines that you can troll through. Um, and I know that's a hot topic in the media right now, but it is just not evidence-based medicine that vaccines ever caused autism. So take a look up to date if you are interested in that. So first let's talk about measles, um, also called rubiola. Um, when you have a measles case, you are going to put on um, airborne precautions. Um, and this is the precautions that are similar to tuberculosis. So um, definitely isolate these patients, have them wear an N95 mask, um, and then you need a negative pressure room and you also need to wear an N95 mask. And these patients are going to present with rash and then um, fever and the rash is going to start at the head and descend down in the truncal areas of the body and it's going to be macular papular and then these patients are also going to have some pathognomonics with them so coplic spots are these white so spots in, inside their mucosa either on the buccal mucosa or sublingual um, with a red base and it's pretty pathognomonic for measles and then they're also going to have the three c's which is cough conjunctivitis which is redness in both of the eyes and then coryza so this is the inflammation of the inside of the nose seen here is a good example of the rash that you might see with measles so it will start with a macular papular rash that starts on the face and then it moves to the rest of the body and the truncal area is the most common area that it will be shown. And it tends to darken and coalesce over time. And here you will see a picture of the coplic spots that I was talking about. And this is pretty pathognomonic for measles. So it is going to be these white spots seen on the buccal or sublingual areas of the mouth. And then they're gonna have an erythematous red base at the bottom. So when it comes to the diagnosis of measles, it's usually a clinical diagnosis, and we like to use those, um, the rash, the fever, and the pathognomonic of the coplic spots, and then the three Cs. But you can also send off labs, and that can be um, PCR, measles PCR, IgM, or IgG. Um, and then the treatment is going to be all supportive, so antipyretics and fluids. Um, and then you're going to want to treat any other secondary bacterial infections. Um, and then the World Health Organization also recommends um, supplementing vitamin A to these patients as well. It has been shown to have some benefit there as well. So um, the most common complications with measles are going to be those secondary bacterial infections. Um, and then you're also going to have the most common complication is going to be diarrhea. So make sure these patients stay very, very hydrated. Um, and then the most common measles associated death is respiratory complications. And then you can also have encephalitis with measles as well. So when you have a measles patient, yes, do the supportive treatment, but also keep your eye out look for those other complications because those are going to be the things that you would admit the patient for and um, require further investigation and or treatment in the inpatient um, ward. So keep that in mind. 
So moving down the line to mumps cases. Um, so this is the case that I saw in the emergency department. Um, and this person came in with fevers and sublingual, um, submandibular lymphadenopathy and parotitis. And that's pretty much the classic presentation of mumps. Um, and they were from the area that was having the outbreak. Um, so the labs you want to get, get for mumps are IgG, IgM, and PCR, um, usually not indicated, but, um, it is if you want to track down how many mumps cases in your area. So I usually grab them. Um, the precautions that we put on this person are the same as the flu. So it's droplet precautions. Um, so you just wear a normal mask when you go in, make sure you always close the door. Um, make sure the patient also wears their own mask and anyone in the room wears their own mask. Um, the treatment's going to be supportive, just like measles. There's no additional vitamin A that's recommended in this case. Um, and then you're just going to want to treat any type of complications with mumps. And the most common complications are orchitis and epididymitis. Um, and then there's also some neurologic complications. Deafness can be one, and you can also have encephalitis. So keep those in mind when you are treating and or thinking about admitting someone for a mumps complication. So the last one I want to talk about is rubella. Um, and in rubella cases, you are going to want to exercise droplet precautions again. So just like um, the mumps cases. So just wear a mask when you go in the room, have the patient wear a mask. There's no negative pressure in 95 like in the measles cases. Um, and then always quarantine these, pa these patients for seven days. So have minimal contact with any of these patients um, for seven days if they go home or they're admitted. Um, and then they are going to present with fevers, some lymphadenopathy. Um, they are also going to have a rash. They'll have some arthralgias. Um, and then they may also have Forsheim response. So they're going to be febrile. They're going to have a rash that's very similar to measles going head to toe. Um, but this rash is more rapidly spreading head to toe. And then it doesn't coalesce and it doesn't darken like in measles cases. So you're going to have a rash that really starts at head and then all of a sudden it's over the rest of the body. It happens quickly and then it stays that way. It doesn't darken. It doesn't coalesce like the measles cases. Um, so it's very similar in the spreading distribution, but it doesn't, it spreads faster and then it doesn't change thereafter. Um, and then these patients might also have Forsheim response. Um, and this is not pathognomonic like the coplic spots in measles cases, but these Forsheim response are an anthem inside the mouth, usually on the soft palate, and it's just dark little spots. It can be seen in other diseases. Um, so it's again, not pathognomonic for rubella, but it can be seen. Um, and then these patients also might have arthralgias. Um, the arthralgias start when the rash starts and they can last for up to one month afterwards. Um, and then other non-vague uh, things may be conjunctivitis as well or lymphadenopathy malaise. Um, so keep that in mind when you're thinking about a patient that might have rubella. So this is the rash that you will likely see with rubella. So again, it starts on the face and then quickly goes to the trunk much quicker than measles. And then once it gets there, it does not coalesce and it does not darken in color thereafter. So again, the so treatment for MMR, all of these is going to be supportive and or treating the complications of. And the complications of rubella are going to be a lot of maternal and or fetal complications. So mothers that have rubella are going to have um, concomitant fetal complications like growth retardation, uh, mental retardation, um, congenital deafness, ophthalmic defects, cardiac defects. Um, definitely don't let these patients come into contact with mothers because that is when rubella gets dangerous. The vaccine was actually first invented to prevent children from becoming close to mothers and getting the mothers getting rubella because then that's become, it comes very dangerous at that time. And that's it guys. Thanks for listening. Um, I hope this was a good review for measles, mumps, and rubella. Uh, and I'm sorry if it's a little later than when the epidemic has gotten to your area, but um, either way, the 
um, number of unvaccinated children in the world is rising, unfortunately. So just keep this in mind for any child that comes in with a fever and or a rash. Um, it could definitely be any one of these three and to always consider them, ask about immunizations, and then even further consider them even if they are immunized. So um, thanks for listening, guys. See you next week.